Hello, good afternoon. I have two pieces of housekeeping business to begin, if I may. First request, please sure to turn off the beepers and the rings on your electronic gizmos. And second, uh, a request that there be no photography during this afternoon's event. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Louise Cowan, and as the Warden of Heart House, it's my great honor to welcome you to today's event with esteemed professor of linguistics, prol prolific author, political theorist, and public intellectual, Dr. Noam Chomsky, who will speak to the state corporate complex, a threat to freedom and survival. Before turning the floor over to Linda McQuaig, who will introduce our guest, I would like to tell you a little bit about Heart House and the Heart House Debates Committee, the student group co-hosting today's event with Science for Peace and the Near East Cultural Educational Foundation, and share with you in particular why we're so pleased to have the opportunity to host Professor Chomsky. The Heart House vision statement describes Heart House as a living laboratory of social, artistic, cultural, and recreational experiences where all voices, rhythms, and traditions converge as the vibrant home for the education of the mind, body, and spirit envisioned by its founders, Heart House encourages and supports activities that provide spaces for awakening the capacity for self-knowledge and self-expression. Heart House has always stood as the proud champion of education that extends beyond the lecture hall. And our vision statement expresses our commitment to offer richly diverse programming to provide students with entry points to find their voice, awaken their curiosity, challenge deeply held ideas, and negotiate emerging identities. Events such as today's lecture contribute to our goal and to the fabric of campus life by providing spaces for critical discourse and dissenting opinions and for campus and communi community members to engage in vital conversations, thereby helping us all make meaning of the world around us. The Hart House Debates Committee, made up of students from across the university, focused their activities on creating opportunities for debate and dialogue on the important issues of the day. They are one of a number of student groups at Hart House who give voice to our vision through diverse programming conceived and executed by students, for students, and the broader community. Over the past few years, the Debates Committee have hosted events on topics such as the limits of free speech, the criminalization of HIV status, gender testing in sports, Canada's role in Afghanistan, dealing with dictators, Sharia law in Ontario, as well as debates among political leaders at the provincial the local and the federal levels. Given this rich tradition, the committee is particularly pleased to host Professor Chomsky and in so doing, provide an opportunity for students and members of the broader community to engage with his powerful critique of the current model of global capitalism. So without further delay, I'm pleased to invite Linda McQuaig to formally introduce Professor Chomsky. Linda McQuaig has earned a national reputation for taking on the establishment. The National Post called McQuaig Canada's Michael Moore. Career highlights include winning a National Newspaper Award for a series of Globe and Mail articles which sparked a public, public inquiry into the activities of political lobbyist Patty Starr, eventually leading to Starr's imprisonment, and two McLean's cover stories probing the questionable business dealings of Conrad Black. McQuaig has also taken on the prevailing orthodoxies in a series of books about politics and economics, including seven national Canadian bestsellers. Her latest book, The Trouble with Billionaires, written with tax professor Neil Brooks, shows how the rise of an exceptionally wealthy new elite has far-reaching negative consequences for society. Please join me in a warm welcome for Linda McQuaig. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise, for those very kind words, which I appreciate very much, uh, and thank you for that warm welcome. I, I just want to say how absolutely thrilled and delighted I am to be here introducing 
someone who for so long has been an icon and legendary hero to me. How does one introduce Noam Chomsky, my God? Um, just a few kind of highlights or a few kind of uh, descriptions of him. Uh, he's been described as arguably the most important intellectual alive today by the New York Times. Perhaps the most widely read voice on foreign policy on the planet. You can see these are superlative types of comments. Um, he's been cited more often than any other living scholar. In fact, he's the eighth most cited source of all time, you know, including Plato and Aristotle, Galileo, Descartes. Oh, and here's one that I've been told to throw in. Uh, he holds an honorary doctorate from U of T. <laughs> and, and just one I would quickly add that he's been a source of inspiration to so many people like myself uh, who aspire in some way to challenge the establishment and challenge the powers that dominate our society. And, and yet, you know, despite this huge uh, impact he's had, uh, you know, being the eighth most cited person in the history of the world, it, it's fascinating to note that he kind of remains outside the mainstream. Uh, I mean, it's, we, we see a huge crowd here today and, and many, many more who've been turned away. And yet, interestingly, you know, it isn't really a media circus. We don't really have thousands of media descending on us the way we do it, if, would if presumably Aristotle or Descartes or somebody like that was here. And that's because to a certain extent, I think the media treats Chomsky with suspicion and, and, and even with hostility. In fact, he was just telling me at lunch that the only uh, American media that puts him on regularly is Fox News. <laughs> I think that's probably more out of a kind of curiosity uh, than any serious interest in his views. Uh, Professor Chomsky started out, of course, in the field of linguistics. Uh, as a young professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he kind of revolutionized the field of linguistics. He's described often as the father of modern linguistics, he, and he's received enormous public recognition for the breakthrough work he's done in linguistics and continues to do uh, as a leading thinker in this field, perhaps the leading thinker. But the fascinating thing is when he turned his focus from linguistics, where he was treated as an international superstar, when he turned that focus to political analysis and that same, used that same formidable intellect that led to all those breakthroughs in thinking in linguistics, when he applied that to political analysis, the reception was very different. In fact, uh, the reception was often very hostile. Uh, he started doing this in a very prominent way early in the days of the Vietnam War, and he challenged the American role in ways that people simply weren't ready for, or at least the elite was not ready for. And so the hostility that came at him is perhaps not surprising uh, when you think of what Chomsky did. What Chomsky did and what Chomsky continues to do is to challenge and expose power, to expose what it's about, uh, expose it in its full naked truth and expose its goals and all the myths that surround it. So for instance, he challenged the notion, the widely held and accepted notion that what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam or what it's done in so many other countries was in some way kind of benign and that it was about bringing good or or helping other people, or making the world safe for terrorists, or, or, or whatever. That somehow the US, in its exercise of power, was different than other imperial powers had been in the past. Uh, in fact, Chomsky has exposed relentlessly that both the United States and increasingly Canada, as we get on board with American activities abroad, shall we say, 
uh, was in fact in, is in fact advancing specific interests in the way all imperial powers do, and that those interests are are largely corporate interests. Now, in exposing this sort of thing, uh, he also, of course, exposes the role of the intellectual, and this has been some of his most important work, the intellectuals, the academics, the, the media. Uh, he exposes their failure to challenge power, to specifically challenge the power of their own governments. In other words, they can be incredibly insightful and they can be incredibly uh, tough when they go after the enemy. They can see the hypocrisy and the nakedness of the power of, let's say, the Soviets or the bureaucrats in Iran. But they are so often, the intellectual elite here, so often blind when, when looking at the actions of our own, our own side. Uh, our leading commentators, in fact, uh, you know, tend to be enormously soft on those in power here and, in fact, tend to, to, to be apologists for power. In fact, Chomsky often compares them. He'll suddenly make the point that, you know, that could have been spoken by somebody at Pravda. And by the way, when you hear that, it, at first it sort of jars you. When you actually go through and read his stuff, it's so relentless, it's so meticulous, it's so careful. Uh, you, come in, you come away realizing he's absolutely right. Uh, and when you do that, of course, you'll never feel the same about Peter Mansbridge again. Uh, and in doing this, of course, Chomsky's focusing on the abdication of responsibility on the part of intellectuals that, on, on our side. You know, when they see atrocities committed by our side and wars abroad, you know, they talk about, well, things may have gone wrong, that shouldn't have happened, there was a little collateral damage. But in fact, what Chomsky so clearly shows is, is that this is part of systematic, ruthless exercise of power, advancing very specific interests, interests of corporate power, um, and that it's done with an absolute, reckless, callous, regard or indifference for people around the world. Uh, and in this way, by doing this, uh, you know, the, our intellectuals and in failing to pick up on, the, on what our elite is doing is, in a sense, providing a sort of cover for them. I was reminded of this uh, a couple of years ago. Remember when, after the war in Iraq, and it was finally acknowledged clearly that the war in Iraq had, been about, had not been about weapons of mass destruction. I think Dick Cheney eventually even acknowledged it. Uh, now, now that's a kind of crucial revelation, right? And I remember watching Wolf Blitzer on CNN, and he was kind of scratching his head and said, my goodness, how could we have all got it so wrong? And I was thinking, we? You know, I remember before the invasion of Iraq, I remember 10 million people out in the streets all over the world protesting that invasion. They somehow didn't get it wrong. They, in fact, I remember them carrying signs, uh, you know, how did their oil get, how did our oil get under their sand? You know, and I mean, they understood that the invasion uh, probably wouldn't have happened if Iraq was instead of sitting on a ton of oil, was sitting on, let's say, a ton of carrots or something. But somehow, Wolf Blitzer and the people in the media didn't get that. Uh, they didn't get it because they didn't have the same skepticism that ordinary people have. And they didn't ask the tough questions, even though they were very much in a position to ask those tough questions. And so as a result, they let those in power slither away. Well, Chomsky never lets those in power slither away. Uh, and in that sense, he is the true public intellectual. Now, I, of course, all this is particularly important, takes on particular meaning the, the, the role of the intellectual when we're talking about the university. Because here, at the university, we think of this as a place of critical inquiry. If anywhere is going to challenge the prevailing norms and the prevailing ideas, it's going to be here at the university. And actually, if you read the U of T statement of purpose, 
you see some incredibly strong statements uh, about how, you know, and this is on the U of T uh, Governing Council's website, we affirm that uh, the university's unique concept, the most crucial of all human rights are the rights of freedom of speech, academic freedom, freedom of research. We affirm that these rights are meaningless unless they entail the right to raise deeply disturbing questions and provocative challenge to the cherished beliefs of society at large and the university itself. It is this human right to radical critical teaching and research with which the university has a duty above all to be concerned because there is no one else, no other institution, no other office in our modern liberal democracy which is the custodian of this most precious and vulnerable right of the liberated human spirit. Wow. I mean, that's powerful. It almost brings tears to your eyes. Uh, a powerful statement of the university as an important body to keep accountable those in power and those and to keep an, a, a critical eye on what's going on. In fact, in reality, the university often, I must say, fails to live up to this. Of course, many of you are familiar with the situation of the Monk School of Global Affairs, the $35 million uh, donation given by Peter Monk, the CEO of Barrett Gold, to set up a School of Global Affairs. Um, and this, of course, raises the question, you know, will that school encourage the kind of investigation of, let's say, mining companies operating in the third world that a school of global affairs logically should? I can say from looking at the Monk Agreement with U of T that there's reason to worry about this, that in fact Monk has more influence than, than one would, would want. Um, that the biggest part of his, or a big part of his donation, 15 million, is only to be given down the road uh, and only after uh, he's satisfied with the direction of the school. He also spec it's also specified in the agreement that um, the monk school will be in this beautiful heritage building and only the senior professors and their guests will be allowed to enter by the front door that everybody else, the junior faculty, the public, the students, will enter by the back door. Anyway, you may know there's a protest this afternoon. In fact, right after this event, there's a protest uh, going before the Governing Council to, uh, in, out in front of the Governing Council to urge them to reconsider this, this whole monk situation. And Professor Chomsky has indicated that he plans to attend. <laughs> in fact, he's invited me to go along with him. And, you know, if any one of you wanted to come along too, we could make it a party. And I just want to point out that we will be entering by the front door. Um, now, I dropped off uh, Professor Chomsky last night at his hotel after his speech out at U of T Scarborough, and I was struck by the fact that I pulled up and a taxi driver started honking at me, and I thought, oh boy, I you know, parked in the wrong place or something. And the guy was really insistent, and it turned out it was just he was so excited. There was Noam Chomsky, <laughs> um, who he'd seen back in his native Greece years ago and always you know, remained a huge fan of. And this just kind of reminded me why Chomsky is in fact the most important intellectual alive today, that you know, he exposes those in power and the way they exercise and abuse power and the elites that cooperate and cover up for them. And he does all this in the public interest, in the interest of the common person. And, and I, you know, more than any individual today, I think it can be truly sad that Noam Chomsky speaks truth to power. I give you Noam Chomsky. Thank you very much. I'm uh, 
I'm going to talk mostly about the United States, uh, in part because I know it better, uh, but also in part because of its uh, unique significance in the global system. That's uh, been true uh, dramatically since the Second World War. The character and extent of this uniqueness uh, often isn't understood and uh, would be easily worth a talk in itself, but I won't go into that. However, we constantly see that uh, even in uh, uh, relatively small ways. So, for example, when uh, a housing bubble in the United States burst a couple of years ago, uh, that initiated a global uh, economic crisis, which uh, most of the world is still mired in. Uh, the uh, worst outcomes were just uh, averted by quite desperate measures. Uh, in another domain, when uh, France and Britain uh, wanted to bomb Libya a couple of weeks ago, uh, they had to turn to a more uh, reluctant uh, Washington to do the heavy lifting and provide the uh, vast bulk of the means of violence. The uh, U.S. has a huge uh, comparative advantage in that domain. Uh, furthermore, although uh, the United States... Uh, U.S. society and its uh, political economy uh, are unusual in some respects. Uh, it's not that different from elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, the uh, developments within the United States over the years have often foreshadowed what is uh, uh, going to happen pretty soon in uh, other uh, uh, industrial societies of the state capitalist world. Uh, well, the, that world, in fact, the whole world, is, of course, always changing, uh, but there are significant continuities, and they're worth bearing in mind. Uh, one continuity is that those who uh, uh, control the economic life of a country uh, also tend to have overwhelming influence uh, over state policy. And that should be a truism taught in elementary school that was... Uh, formed succinctly by Adam Smith in words that I've quoted before but are important enough to repeat. Uh, he, speaking of Britain, of course, he wrote that the principal architects of policy uh, are the owners of the society, in his day the merchants and manufacturers, the masters of mankind, as he called them, and they ensure that state policy serves their interest however grievous the effect on others, including the domestic population, but primarily the victims of what he called their savage injustice abroad. And India was his prime example. Uh, it was early in the days of the destruction of India. Uh, well, today the uh, masters of mankind are uh, uh, multinational corporations and financial institutions, but the lesson still applies, and it helps explain why the state corporate complex is indeed a threat to freedom and, in fact, even survival. Well, by now there are uh, important uh, elaborations of Smith's truism applied to the modern world. Uh, the most significant and sophisticated version that I know is by uh, political economist uh, Thomas Ferguson, what he calls his investment theory of politics, which in brief uh, and simplified essentially views U.S. elections as uh, occasions in which uh, coalitions of private investors uh, coalesce uh, to invest to control the state. It turns out to be a thesis of quite high predictive success over more than a century, as he shows. Uh, what it means, in effect, is that uh, elections are pretty much bought and that the buyers expect to be rewarded. And that happens all the time. It was illustrated very clearly in the uh, last U.S. presidential election in 2008. Uh, President Obama's victory uh, traces largely to a, a huge uh, influx of capital from the financial institutions especially toward the end of the campaign. They prefer, preferred him to his uh, opponent, uh, McCain, and they expected to be rewarded, and of course they were. 
Uh, the country at that time was mired in a deep recession, uh, so Obama's first act was to select an economic team. It was drawn almost entirely from those who had caused the severe economic crisis that he inherited. He systematically avoided uh, critics of their practices, including quite prestigious ones, Nobel laureates. Uh, actually, the business press uh, wrote rather ironically about this. Uh, Bloomberg News did a review of Obama's economic team, went through each one of them, uh, looked at their records, and said, concluded that uh, these people shouldn't be uh, on the economic team to fix up the economy. They should be getting subpoenas, which was pretty correct. They didn't, of course. Well, not surprisingly, the team chose measures which rewarded the major culprits who are now uh, richer and more powerful than before and uh, poised to lead the way to the next and uh, probably more severe financial crisis. Now, there was recently an interesting article about this by uh, the special inspector of the bailout programs, Neil Borofsky. Uh, he wrote a bitter condemnation of the way it was executed. Uh, he points out that the legislative act that authorized the bailout was a bargain. Uh, the financial institutions that were responsible for the crisis uh, would be saved by the taxpayer and the victims of their misdeeds, in fact, real crimes, the victims would be somewhat compensated by measures to protect uh, home values and preserve uh, home ownership. It was mostly a housing crisis. Well, only the first part of the bargain was kept. The financial institutions were rewarded uh, lavishly for causing the crisis, and they were forgiven for outright crimes, but the rest of the program uh, floundered. Uh, as Borofsky points out, I'm quoting him, uh, foreclosures continue to mount uh, with eight to 13 million filings forecast over the program's lifetime, while the biggest banks are 20% larger than they were before the crisis, and control a larger part of the economy than ever. They reasonably assume that the government will rescue them again if necessary. Indeed, credit rating agencies, uh, credit rating uh, agencies incorporate future gov uh, government market uh, bailouts into their assessments of the largest bank. That means exaggerating market distortions that provide them with an unfair advantage uh, over smaller institutions which continue to struggle. So in short, as he puts it, Obama's programs were a giveaway to Wall Street executives and a blow in the solar plexus to their defenseless victims. In other words, the government uh, listened uh, to those who have a voice in the political system and acted accordingly, all completely in accord with uh, Smith's truism. Well, there should be no surprises here. There are uh, careful studies of Senate votes over a long period, and they show that the Senate is indeed responsive to a sector of the population, uh, the top third in income. Actually, a closer analysis would show that it's a very small fraction of that uh, top third. In contrast, there's no correlation at all between Senate votes and opinions of the middle third. Uh, for the bottom third, uh, there is a correlation. It's negative. Uh, Senate votes are counter to preferences for the bottom third. And on major issues of foreign and domestic policy, there's quite a sharp disconnect between public opinion and public policy uh, over a long period. Well, one might argue that these results don't really depart very far from the intentions of the founders of the society. So James Madison, who was the main framer of the constitutional order, uh, he explained to the constitutional convention that uh, power should remain in the hands of the Senate. The Senate was not chosen directly by voters until about a century ago. Uh, 
in those days, uh, the executive was pretty much an administrator, not an emperor. And the house, third part of the system, which is closer to the public, had much more limited authority. And that's the way, in fact, it was set up. Uh, as Mott Madison explained to the Constitutional Convention, the Senate represents the wealth of the nation, the more capable set of men, men who have respect for property owners and their rights, and understand that government must protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. That's quite accurate, something else that ought to be taught in elementary school. Uh, we should uh, bear in mind, however, in kind of in Madison's defense, that his mentality was pre-capitalist. So he assumed 